Good morning, everybody. My name is Helge Holden. I'm the Secretary General of the International Mathematical Union. And the IMU is handing out the Fields Medal and the Nevadlina Award. And it gives me great pleasure that in this opening session of today, we have one Fields Medalist and one Nevadlina winner. So the first uh, talk will be presented by Wendelin Werner, who got uh, the Fields Medal in 2006 as the first probabilist. He's working in probability theory, more particularly with random processes. And he's a professor at ETH in Zurich. So Wendlin, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Helge. Um, it's uh, a great pleasure to be back here, I mean, in Heidelberg, or close to Heidelberg again, uh, for the second time uh, for this uh, forum. Um, last time I came, uh, I said, uh, you know, it felt a bit uh, strange to come back to Heidelberg. Uh, uh, last time I was here was, uh, you know, as a young student like, like you, coming after the night train, arriving with a backpack uh, at the Heidelberg station in, in the morning and trying to find a place to get a, a, a breakfast. And, um, I remember that uh, for the first time in my life, at, those at this time, the only place that was open was a luxury hotel uh, next to the, you know, in the center of town uh, that was already open. And so we entered and, and somehow we had the, the luxury breakfast that happened to be not very uh, expensive, uh, surprisingly. And uh, so, uh, and then I felt like this was really a different world of, uh, you know, this fancy hotels and uh, things. And now when you arrive as a laureate, uh, you know, you, you're offered a black limousine, uh, you know, to, to take you from the airport and uh, you arrive at the, you know, crazy hotel. And, uh, and it's always very dangerous because you, you, you sort of uh, have to, you know, uh, force yourself to not get used to that. <laughs> right. Yeah, to re Okay, so, um, my, um, the, the other thing I might also repeat from five, year, four, five years ago is that, uh, uh, you know, when, when you are given the opportunity to speak in front of, uh, you know, a, a crowd of very uh, clever young brains uh, who are going to build the future in their respective countries, um, it feels a, it's a heavy responsibility. It's a big burden. You know, we feel, you know, who am I that, you know, to give, you know, advice or say something uh, that might be interesting or relevant for, for all of you. Um, you know, in some sense, the, the most important thing in science is to be, you know, first of all, to like it, uh, to do it because you like it, uh, not to worry at all about the prizes. And, you know, we are here, this laureate thing is about the people who got prizes, and we are sort of here to tell you somehow, well, if you do science, you know, the, you know, the worst possible reason, at least for me, is to, in order to get a prize one day, because that's not the, certainly not the goal, it only would lead to frustration or, you know. And the other thing is like, you know, sometimes science works well, you know, we, we take, we try something out, we have ideas, we test them, sometimes it works, um, but most of the time it doesn't, right? So otherwise, you know, if everything would be like, uh, always a, you know, a piece of cake and uh, we, we succeed in everything, um, uh, it, there would be no you know, uh, merit in it somehow. And, um, and so one has to also just have, you know, accept the fact that sometimes you try things, you have ideas and so on, but then uh, sometimes it works, there's a part of luck in it, you know, it's not just you. Uh, and sometimes it's, uh, uh, it doesn't, but Nevertheless, we still uh, like the, the path of trying to, to invent or create new things. Um, I also, uh, while I was preparing today's uh, intervention, I was thinking like, you know, maybe it's me getting older, uh, but um, sometimes, you know, in today's news, uh, in the last four or five years, I felt like, you know, the world I used to grow up in uh, seems to, change, you know, the number of things we, you know, values or that we felt, you know, uh, was, you know, you know, being shared more and more, uh, sort of uh, start being eroded uh, here and there. And um, 
and okay, so, but in some sense, the, the, I think it makes it even more in, important uh, that, you know, science uh, has, you know, there are certain ethical values about, you know, truth and, uh, uh, and also sharing and uh, international aspects and all these things we have to, you know, keep firm on, on all these things and don't, you know, uh, forget to reaffirm it at any occasion. So I'm sorry if I do a bit pontifical uh, things to you, uh, young people, but I just wanted to uh, say that that's one of the, you know, nice aspects of doing science, to be able to, you know, live in a community where mostly these values are, will be, you know, uh, uh, clearly uh, shared. Okay, so now uh, I understand this is the, you know, very often in conferences, uh, when we go to scientific conferences, they take place in, um, uh, during an entire week. And the Friday morning talk is the, maybe not the, you know, uh, I understand you had a Bavarian evening yesterday, and uh, um, so one shouldn't be, one has to be gentle. Uh, you know, the, the brain has to be warmed up again, and, uh, and anyway, I, you know, we can't give you, you know, a technical talk when you're on the mathematical side of things. I'm not going to teach you, uh, you know, give you a lecture about introduction, something with definitions, and so it's a bit of an acrobatic, uh, you know, thing to try to stimulate your imagination to get you some feeling about some nice things in mathematics, maybe, uh, and uh, without actually doing any mathematics, uh, you know, here. And um, in some sense, I'm fortunate because I work on a, on a field which is actually quite amenable to such uh, exercises, at least, I think, uh, because it has to do with randomness and uh, with type of randomness where one can maybe try to see some pictures, so, you know, I can show you pictures and uh, rather than uh, write down slides with definitions. Um, and uh, so that will be my goal today to basically, uh, so the guiding principle will be to ask ourselves some seemingly naive, uh, you know, uh, uh, natural looking questions uh, that in some sense the type of question you might, you know, uh, if you're on a train ride and you start having your mind wander around and you see, well, uh, you know, you might actually end up asking yourself this type of questions. And, um, and then I'll try to illustrate the fact that, you know, look, trying to answer, understanding these questions, well, first of all, uh, when you're asking type of questions that are, have to do with physics world, the, the rule of thumb is that the physicists asked and solved that question before you, right? So they have, they tell you, they give you some answer, they have some, you know, uh, they are very, very clever people, uh, and, um, but nevertheless, as mathematicians, you know, we, maybe we, sometimes we have some, some, some things to say. Um, and uh, so I'll try to illustrate uh, this with some, you know, tell you about some recent themes that uh, mathematicians are working on. And so the general question you could ask is, uh, and again, I'm, this is just a, okay, I was mentioning that somehow implicitly before, this is like a, populist version of uh, the question, right? So I'm not claiming that has anything really to do with, with physics, but you might, you know, ask yourself uh, things like, um, uh, you know, we learn about Newton's law, we know the sun, uh, we learn the, the earth and the gravitational rules and things like that. And you say, yeah, but, you know, what is this, um, uh, is it really so that, you know, the mass are really given and that the force is exactly, you know, you know that this, this exchange of information between the sun and the earth is absolutely, you know, a deterministic thing that is absolutely precise. The earth knows exactly the mass of the sun, the sun knows exactly the mass of the earth, and the, 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 the forces are exactly given by uh, this uh, rule. You say, well, but maybe there might, there might be some little fluctuations. Maybe, you know, this piece of information that goes back and forth, uh, you know, about the measuring distances and things like that, might, that might be a bit, you know, uh, randomized. There might be some little fluctuations that are inherent to some fact that, you know, the, there is this exchange of information between these two uh, things. 
So the natural question is somehow to say, well, you know, what are the natural ways? You start with the Euclidean world, your Euclidean three-dimensional world, and you ask yourself, what are the most natural ways in which you can try to make little fluctuations away from Euclidean geometry? Okay? So you try to ask, you know, what is the natural way in which the distances between points can be, you know, fluctuate away from uh, the actual Euclidean distance in the plane, in, in, in three dimensions. And of course, if you want to do that, it has to be somehow consistent, right? So the distance, it's, it's not just the distance between two points that you're trying to, to, to let vary, but it's the whole space. Okay, so it's the whole notion of the whole function that to any pair of points associate their distance, you know, how could that be? And this big thing that you are going to create has still to be some sort of metric space, some, you know, consistent uh, way to measure sort of distances. And if you ask this question, in, in physics this type of questions has been around for a long time because in some sense it goes down to, you know, the elementary questions about uh, interactions, uh, you know, forces, uh, sort of, you know, uh, field theory is sort of the, the things that are behind. And so in the 70s and 80s this was really like one of the main themes in, in theoretical uh, physics, I would say. And one of the, the names associated to that is not random metrics, uh, because that doesn't sound very physical. Uh, the, the, the name would be quantum gravity. Okay? That sounds more uh, like uh, something. Uh, but if you're talking to a mathematician, if you say random metrics, that looks like much more uh, <laughs> a stimulating thing. Anyway, so. So now I want to, I, I, I want to basically, oh, the other thing is, um, so maybe we can, can switch the uh, screen to my, what, what I see on my laptop. The other thing is um, I always feel my rule of thumb on, on Friday mornings uh, is the first talk should not be a Beamer talk for the reasons I mentioned before having to do with the Thursday night. Um, and uh, as you know, mathematicians have a strange, uh, relation to computers in the sense that um, some pure mathematician will insist on the fact that you know when they are in their office uh, they want to have their picture taken with a pen and a piece of paper just to insist on the fact that the the way they work is really has to do with the you know their own brain and uh, the computer has to be and actually I myself in my office have the computer on a tiny uncomfortable desk in, in one little corner, not on my own desk, uh, because I think that, it, you know, if the computer is, or the iPhone is too close to you, you spend time surfing and doing nothing rather than actually thinking. Uh, uh, and as a result of it, uh, I have big back problems, as uh, some of you know, because uh, I keep always uh, sitting on this uh, uncomfortable uh, <laughs> chair in the corner <laughs> surfing on the internet. Anyway, so, um, so I'm going to use, uh, you know, I know there's no blackboard and uh, nevertheless I'm going to use this, uh, you know, a little program and of course we are, you know, uh, we try to be ethical uh, in a, okay, so what I'm using just for you to know is a program uh, by, uh, written by Denis Roux, who's a very uh, top uh, symplectic geometer who didn't like the programs that, that were, uh, you know, available on the internet in order to write things directly on the, on the, on the screen. Uh, and he wrote this uh, software called Journal, X, I mean, like Journal with an X in front. And just for you to know that this is, you know, sometimes mathematicians do that as well, but uh, uh, writing some, some software that seemed to be uh, good. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to use this, right? So I'm going to, uh, you know, this is going to be my blackboard. And I have some couple of pictures, you know, uh, hidden uh, underneath that I'll try to show you. And there will be no, uh, you know, the usual uh, font uh, format uh, of talks. Okay, so now uh, I have to start my actual scientific part, uh, otherwise there will be no scientific part. And um, so the first thing uh, you learn when you are looking at trying to understand random objects, your first uh, or maybe for me my first uh, big friend uh, that I encountered uh, in, in my math studies was this object called Brownian motion. 
And as you probably all know, Brownian motion in some sense is the random trajectory right, of a particle where you know, informally you might try to understand this random evolution of the particle by saying that at any time it chooses at random sort of a direction in an isotropic way and it forgets uh, where it, you know, it, it has any, you know, it's memoryless. So it's a bit like the, the flight of a, you know, a, as we know insects are very clever and they have lots of uh, things, but if you, if you look at them from far away you might say, well, you know, a little fly has no brain, has no memory, just flies around completely at, like crazy and at each time chooses a direction you know, at random and goes in that direction but, and then immediately you end up with you know, something. Yeah, but if you choose direction all the time then the path can't be differentiable. You know, there's no, something goes wrong with that thing but still what we learn is that this Brownian motion exists, right? So that there is this sort of a, you know, random, so I draw it here in the plane, you know, this random trajectory that you can define in this way and that this has, you know, that, the, the, that this uh, random trajectory is actually a random continuous function. All right? And we know that because of the isotropy of Brownian motion, you know, then it will be related to the Laplacian, it will be related to, you know, potential theory, uh, you know, harmonic function. Harmonic functions, you know, are exactly, I mean, I talked about the Newton potential, you know, 1 over R is the nice harmonic function in, in in, uh, in three-dimensional space. So, you know, it's related to all these uh, zoo of, of objects. So, there's just one little uh, comment I want to stress about Brownian motion, which is that, so this is a trajectory, so horizontally you have time, and vertically you have the, the fluctuation, right? So you go up and down like, uh, like crazy, like this. And uh, the, the thing I want to emphasize is that, um, as I told you, this function is not going to be differentiable anywhere, and it's very easy to see that this, you know, if you, tr if you would try to draw this with your pen, the actual Brownian motion, the pen would go out of, you know, the out of ink instantaneously because the, you know, the length somehow of this red path would be, is infinite, right? Sort of the, it's oscillating very well, it's, it's sort of a, uh, it's a continuous curve, but it, it has this property that it will be, you know, have infinite uh, length immediately. So, in some sense, what you have in this random function is that these sort of random impulses to up or down, you know, the, 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 this function will not be, you know, uh, the, uh, you have infinitely many impulses up and down and somehow they compensate, right, in order to still create a continuous curve, right? So um, it's a little bit like you look at all these little impulses up and down, you take the sum of their absolute values, that would be infinite. But somehow when you look at a given time t, this, all these plus impulses and the minus impulses that happened before, because you look at them in a time-ordered way, they sort of uh, average out and then you see some slight difference between the pluses and the minuses, which is exactly the, the height of your, your, your the Brownian motion at a given time. So in all these cont continuous random objects, it's essential that somewhere you have some cancellation of infinities, right? So you have infinitely many plus impulses, I mean minus, and they cancel out somehow uh, in some sort of magic way. So the cancelling out phenomenon is, you know, you can see, see it in that case as some version of the so-called central limit theorem or something like that. Okay. So that's uh, one-dimensional Brownian motion. I just want to emphasize that you know, if you draw the same thing in two dimensions, so now that's the path of the two-dimensional Brownian, you know, of, a, of an ant, you know, walking at random in the, in the plane, then this, these are the set of points that have been visited, and you see that this is a fairly rough uh, type picture. It looks pretty messy. It looks almost fat, right? Sort of, it looks almost plain filling. Not quite, but, uh, so it is a very fractal, a very strange fractal curve. And, you know, the Brownian motion is doing things in some sense that you never would have expected any continuous function to be able to do, right? So, in some sense what you're doing, the philosophy, you'll, you take a random function, the natural random function, it's going to be this Brownian motion, and then you end up with a function of a type that you have never encountered before. So, for instance, just to illustrate this, 
On the Brownian path, there's a result by Le Gall, which happened to be my former PhD supervisor, a, a result from, uh, well, well, a uh, couple of, you know, many, so three decades ago, something like that, that says that you take the trajectory of a Brownian motion, the plane, up to time one, so on a finite time interval. So for the mathematicians, they know that it's a continuous function, therefore this blue thing is a compact set. And that there will be exceptional times on the path where that the Brownian motion will have visited an uncountable number of times. Right, so it's already not so easy to, to guess that, you know, the Brown, okay, of course, so the Brownian motion can do a loop like that. There will be a double point. And then maybe, you know, it's, you already have to be pretty clever in order to come back again to visit this double point once more, to have a triple point. And what the Brownian motion does is that there are some points that it will actually have visited infinitely many times during a finite time interval, and actually there will be special points that the Brownian motion will have visited uncountably many times. Right? So, and if I ask you to, to, to you know, uh, uh, give me an example of such a function that has infinitely many points in the plane that it has visited, uh, you know, it spent uh, this uncountable number of times visiting those points, you will not be able to, you know, it's, it's not something you can construct. It's a little bit the philosophy of, you know, you certainly know this, you know, uh, standard things about you take a number at random in 0, 1, you know, on the interval 0, 1, then, you know, it, it, it will be like uh, in any piadic decomposition, the number of the different digits will be, you know, uh, 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 fairly well, uh, you know, uh, spread. Uh, and if I ask you to, you know, show, give me any example of such a number that has that property, you have a very hard time to find it. So, right, this is the typical example that says, you know, if you take something at random, it will have always a certain property, but if I ask you to give me one example of such, a, uh, such an object, then you have a hard time. And that will be a, you know, a general theme about uh, what we're going to say here. Okay. So that's Brown in motion, and that was just a little warm-up because I want to now to go to move to a second step, which is uh, this idea that um, imagine that you are looking for, um, instead of a, a random path, so you can see the random path here, the Brown in motion, you can see it as uh, a random function from the time axis into R, right? So at each time, you associate the height of, or the value of the Brownian motion in R2 or R or R2 or R3. But let's just look now at function, real valued functions. Now, in these, uh, there's in sort of field theory in general, the idea is that what you want is to, you have space, it's given, and you want to find a random function that at, to each point in the plane associates something. So, you know, if you are doing fancy physics, the object you want to, you, you want to start to each point in, the, in, in space, you want to asso associate a random object that would be in a Lie group, okay, something like that. But let's look at here, we're going to look at sort of abelian stuff, so um, uh, commutative stuff. So here we just want to look at to any point in space, you want to associate a random number. So it's exactly the same story as before, except that instead of having the time axis, as a parameter space, you replace the time axis by space, right? So you want to have a random function from R2 or R3 into R. And of course, you don't want any random function. You want to have some constraints. So you want this idea that this function should be something like continuous, like two neighboring points. You know, the, the values are two neighboring. There's this constraint that this function has to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, holding together somehow, like the Brown emotion was this random continuous function. Okay, so the way to think about it, to, you know, stimulate your imagination is say, you know, instead of looking at the fluctuation of a violin string, and you say the, you know, the violin string is straight and the fluctuations away from equilibrium of the violin string would be this Brownian motion type fluctuations. Now, Instead of that, you have a tambourine skin. That would be the two-dimensional version. The flat tambourine skin attached to the boundary to be value zero, you know, the height is zero. And then you look at sort of the fluctuations 
the, what is the natural way in which the sunburn skin could fluctuate away from the flat surface. And then what you expect to see is something that would look like a random mountain landscape. Right? So you, instead of looking at this one-dimensional curve, you just now have a real, you know, like uh, in Switzerland where I am now, uh, you know, you have some real mountains when you look out of the window and you have a real topographic map uh, that would describe it. And now you ask the question, uh, what, is, you know, is the, what is the analog to Brownian motion for that question? And then the answer is surprising because it is even worse than, you know, I told you choose a random function in one dimension, you know, this Brownian motion thing at random and what you end up is a random function that is really weird. But it's still a random function, continuous function. Now what happens when you try to define what this analogous object in this random mountain will be, the first surprise is that you get this random object exists, but it's not a random mountain. Right? It's, you know, it's a little bit, you know, choose a function at random, well it's not a function. So what is it? So this object will be, the idea, you can do a little simulation, and um, Right? So if you do it on, on a grid and, and you try to, to uh, you know, look at what happens, and now I, uh, okay, I should zoom in a bit less, a bit more. Okay, so what you see is that this random mountain that you're going to see, you know, it will have, you know, spikes that are created in both directions, a bit everywhere. So you have these sort of plus, and when you let the, the, the grid go to zero, these spikes will become, you know, higher and higher. So in some sense, your random mountain is getting crazy. It's plus minus infinity everywhere. The mountain itself, not its derivative. That's just the, you know, the, the random mountains you would see when you try to do the, your little simulation. Okay? So what's going to happen is that the object that you're going to get in the limit, right, this natural, this random mountain, would be, uh, in some sense, intuitively, an object that is plus and minus infinity everywhere in some sort of dense way. So you will not be able to say what the value of the height of the mountain is at a given point. That will not work. But there are things you can do. Namely, you will be able to say something, okay, if I, take, if I give myself uh, uh, you know, some area, like that. So I, you know, I cut out a little area here and here, and I look at, and I ask the question, what is the mean height of the mountain on that area, on that piece of land? Right? I sample this random mountain and ask, what is the mean height of this mountain on this piece of land? Of course, it doesn't make sense per se, because the mountain itself is not defined, I told you, but what happens is that the random object that you can still define is this mean value, right? Because if you integrate these plus and minus infinity spikes on this area, piece of area, what happens is that you have these plus and minus infinities that are cancelled somehow, and on this piece of land, you will have an actual mean height. So for those, you know, this for those of you who studied math and remember maybe, you know, generalized functions or Schwarz distributions or these type of things. What this is telling you is that you can integrate any test function somehow, you know, smooth test function and say what is the mean value of this random object on, uh, you know, here the indicator function of a, of a set. And, um, but you can't define the object pointwise. So that's exactly a random Schwarz distribution. All right? So it's an object that say, tells you uh, you, can, you can do these type of objects. But of course, they, these, there is, you know, the, the, these random plus and minus impulses that you are you know, summing up, they are not independent. Right? What happens here and what happens there, they are sort of, you know, uh, there's this web of constraints that tells you that there is an interaction between what you see here and what you see there. Okay, so you have this sort of 
fairly mysterious object. And um, the, in, in, in the, somehow in the physics literature, the general philosophy was, um, OK, this object is just a random generalized function. So its geometry, you can forget about it. But we are interested in what so-called these correlation functions, which are you know, just some, uh, you know, some, some numbers that you can still read out of these random objects. But you don't want to look at the random mountain itself anymore. OK. Now, so this Gaussian free field, that's the name of this uh, random mountain, if you are in two or higher dimensions, is this random, completely crazy, generalized function, which has plus and minus infinities everywhere that cancel and that you can sort of average out. OK, so now um, this is sort of the, the, this Gaussian free field is sort of the, you know, zero building block of field theory in physics, right? So for physicists, that would be like the trivial, you know, that's sort of the, it's, it's a little bit like for, for us, you know, if you're working field theory, this object here is like the zero for us if you're doing number theory, right? That's just the, the most trivial object. I just want to emphasize just one thing. You might have heard about, you know, that the, one of the big questions is, has to do with young Mills theory, constructor young Mills field, like that. Here, the idea would be a little bit the same. You know, the goal would be to try to, uh, and that has sort of motivations coming from understanding the standard models in physics and things like that, uh, where basically the question is to say, well, we don't want to define a random function, the natural random function from R3 into R. But where now the values of uh, the random function takes place in a Lie group. So you can think of uh, a matrix, matrices, an SU something, right, for the mathematician. And now the constraints will be that two neighboring things, right, two neighboring, instead, they will still have to be, you know, very close together, nearby. But the interaction, because of the fact that matrices are not commutative, you know, the, there is some, there's a little modification, you know, in the, the, the way the, the constraint that two neighboring things have to be actually close together that have to do with the fact that, you know, if you, if you look at the modification, you know, if you go up here along a loop and you come back and you, you know, integrate all these little modifications that you have done in your height somehow, but now the height doesn't make any sense because it's in some abstract non-commutative things, then there will be some constraints there. Right, so what I mean is that the sort of natural attempt to try to generalize this Gaussian free field in the case where you try to say that, you know, instead of being real valued and uh, commutative, because R is commutative, you are taking the values in something just a slightly bit more elaborate, then you end up, you know, in one of the main open questions of contemporary mathematics, which is to build this young Mills uh, field. Okay, now, Let's come back to our initial question, which had to do with the, with the idea that we want to find the natural way to define a metric in d-dimensional space. So what I'm going to do now is, for simplicity and also because that's the topic where we can actually show things, work in two dimensions. So we are in the Euclidean planar geometry, two dimensions. Two dimensions is nice because, as we know, uh, our big friend Riemann is there, and um, complex analysis is there. There's a lot of structure that has to do with conformal transformations in two dimensions uh, that make that, you know, in some sense, it's a very, very rich uh, uh, structure to work in two dimensions. So we work, we want to find the natural ways to distort the Euclidean metric. Now, here is a an idea that dates back to, again, physicists, and I think one big name would be Polyakov, a uh, physicist in Princeton in the early 80s. And, but there's a big Russian school, a big French school, a big uh, British, uh, it's, it's like a big, uh, big, uh, big story. And the basic idea would be to say, well, the natural way to do is, first of all, instead of trying to look at the metrics, the distances, maybe we should you know, view as, you know, if you distort space somehow, then maybe you can change the notion of area, right? Rather than measuring distances, you measure areas. So the idea would be, you know, what would be the natural, 
perturbations away from the Euclidean area. Right? So, so you want to distort somehow your, your planar domain in such a way that you know, now any given domain that is here will have, instead of having the Euclidean area, will have another random area. And Polyakov said, well, the natural way to do that, I know the, na the physical way, is just, I know the random area would be exponential of gamma times this Gaussian free field times dx dy. That would be the natural way to do that. Okay, so the density of points near a given, at a given points will be a multiple of the exponential of the Gaussian free field. Now, what you learn is that the Gaussian free field, being a generalized function, at school you learn you are not supposed to take the exponential of a generalized function. That's strictly forbidden. doesn't make any sense because it means you are multiplying these things with themselves and that's, that's, you have to make sense. However, because of the natural special structure of this Gaussian free field, it, may, it is possible by some regularization procedure to make sense of that. So the idea would be that the places where the Gaussian free field is plus infinity will get a lot of mass and where it's minus infinity will be zero, roughly speaking, but this will be in some sort of fractal everywhere type sense. And in this way you can define this random area for reasons that are, I cannot explain here, one very special value of gamma turns out to be uh, important. I mean, first of all, you can do that only when this when gamma is not too large. When gamma is too large, then some of these plus infinity things, you will know, have no way to, to, to make sense of this object, but you can do that. And now what I want to just to show you is, uh, so there's one special value of gamma that turns out to be, uh, you know, it's nice to have a little bit of numerology, Right, so of course I haven't told you what the Gaussian free field is, so, right? so here's the, the good value of gamma. That is the natural fluctuations of, you know, the, away from the Euclidean metric or Euclidean area thing. That would be exactly that object for that one particular value of gamma. Now time is running out, so as planned, so I'm going to now just show you um, uh, further, you know, pictures just to illustrate uh, this thing. So, this uh, are pictures I'm going to show you. I stole from, there's a, one of a, a very bright young colleagues, well, maybe he's not that young anymore, but younger colleagues, or younger than me, <laughs> well, I don't know, uh, less old than me, uh, who, who's um, uh, Jason Miller in Cambridge. I'm going to show you his webpage in a moment. When you Google him, type Jason Miller math, Otherwise, you end up with some other Jason Millers you don't want to see. Uh, and you, this is just, you know, somehow the, the density, you, you choose at random some points, the way to understand it, according to this area measure, they are thrown like that. And so, basically, the, the, the places where you have lots of red and blue points are those where the, these, uh, you know, the area is sort of, there's a lot of area there, and the, the sparser places are those where you have less area. And then you can, you know, because it has to do with complex analysis, we like circle packings, you know, so just to illustrate the fact that there is complex analysis behind and uh, that you can make nice, uh, fun pictures like that. But this is the type of thing you would end up with if you try to do something like, you know, you have the sphere, you have the random metric of the sphere, you sample your points at random according to this random thing. This is the type of object you have. Now, Big developments in mathematics in the last 10 years on the probability side is basically about the understanding of these structures. Saying that these random areas correspond to random, actually really random metrics and understanding those objects. So that's a nice picture. Here, what you see is for this nice random metric, I'm giving you the shape of the balls, right? So each, the boundary of the red thing here you know, the, everything that is covered here is the number, is the set of points that you can reach that are a distance less than one from the center, right? And you have distorted now, instead of a round ball, you have this sort of weird structures like that. And you see there are little holes there, you know, there, there are, the balls have little holes because there are little pockets of resistance where it's very difficult to enter there, right? So one of the big results, I mean, one of the elementary results is that the fractal dimension of the metric space you define, the random metric space you define like this, is not two. It's four. Okay. Right, so that somehow the, the immediately when you try to you know, make these fluctuations, you have these fractal pockets of you know, uh, resistance, uh, 
high, you know, places where it's difficult to, to, to go to. So here's another picture where, again, it sort of illustrates that on these random objects, then you can try to define random curves, natural random space filling curves that are one of the tools that two of the main players, which are called Jason Miller and Scott Sheffield, in, in, this, in, in this direction, you know, were used in order to understand uh, these, these structures. Right, and uh, that's another one that is not directly related, in, just indirectly related, but just to show you that sometimes randomness can, you know, um, it's, it's always the general question. I, I remember that when I was a student, there was always the question about, you know, is Xenakis music art? You know, is the random generated music uh, actually art, piece of art? Okay. So here, I, I like to think that this is maybe a more compelling evidence uh, that uh, indeed, you know, sometimes randomly created objects can be, uh, you know, you can print it out and put in your uh, living room and look like a piece of art and uh, pretend it is, which it isn't, but uh, it looks quite uh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, that's another one of, okay, that's one of, one of my papers with uh, Scott and Jason, but, and just to conclude, um, as we have heard, the internet is very important nowadays, and uh, the future is there, and uh, that's where. So if you go on Jason's webpage, which is here, then uh, you go home, and you have images here, and then you have all these uh, pictures I stole. You can recognize, you know, you have lots of little uh, illustrations of uh, all these, what, these random quantum gravity here. Then you have all these metric balls. Here you have this thing that is called, uh, whoops, uh, you know, like simulations of uh, things that look like diffusion-limited aggregations on these random geometries and uh, structures like that. So you have lots of fun mathematical objects. And these are not just curiosities. They are actually, you know, the objects that you have to use in order to understand these, you know, random geometric, uh, uh, you know, fluctuations away from the Euclidean metric. And with that, uh, I will uh, stop so that I'll be... Uh, that my chair doesn't have to, to stop me and <coughs> uh, uh, so um, I would like to, to I hope uh, I gave you a little glimpse of uh, some of the topics that we like to that you know some of the people working in probability theory are uh, interested in these days and um, I remember I just to conclude uh, it's this Bef you know, in the train arriving uh, yesterday night, um, I, I reread again, you know, in order to put my brain in the right frame of mind about, you know, what my responsibility was uh, addressing you people. I reread this uh, essay by Max Weber, which is called, uh, uh, I think probably in, in English would be Scientist as a Profession or something like that, Wissenschaft als Beruf. So he has a two two options, Wissenschaft als Beruf and Wissenschaft uh, and Politik als Beruf, something like that, which is uh, Politik as a... And uh, he was a sociologist and his talks were given in Munich exactly well, 101 years ago, something like that. And he describes the different academic worlds of Germany and the US and so you hear all the time that everything is changing and you know all these things have completely transformed and so but you read this and you feel, well, uh, not much has changed, actually, right, sort of that. Um, and he was giving this lecture in, you know, to an audience of, like you, in some sense, uh, younger uh, people. Um, and, um, and yes, so he was insisting on, you know, the, the fact, yeah, all the ethical aspects of uh, how one has to behave when we are given the right to think, uh, you know, and uh, to do science and, uh, uh, and yes, uh, just one comment is he already points out that uh, one of the key points for scientists and good science is freedom and not only freedom and it's just one way because I know there will be uh, something about how to do good science a bit later and I just want to already peek a little bit in maybe some of what uh, the, you know, the general thing is that nowadays we have to, you know, uh, make grant proposals, right? Every one of us. And when you do grant proposals, of course it's fine because you have to, you know, the money has to be allocated to people who propose to do something. But I consistently write my grant proposals uh, just saying, I'll do my best, dot. 
Okay? I'm not going to tell you exactly what the plan is, what the, you know, the roadmap, and, you know, there's all these things that you have to fill in, you know, uh, the roadmap, uh, you know, in March, in two years' time, I will be switching from that question to that question once the previous one will be solved, and things like that. And um, I think, especially in mathematics, you know, if, of course, if you have a big lab, experimental lab, that's relevant because you need to know who you are. But in certain parts of mathematics, it's really not the, it's counterproductive, right? And so it's important that we, you know, of course we need the money, so we have to fill in these forms. But collectively, as a community, we, we do it, but we don't accept it, right? In the sense, we don't integrate it as being part of setting up our agenda. And, uh, and that's just one, one part of that you sh one should really uh, you know, when I say I'll do my best, I mean it, right? I, I work until 2 a.m. on Sunday, on Saturday night, and, uh, you know, I work hard, right? Mo much harder than, you know, uh, that's part of the game of being a scientist, that you have to, you know, it's difficult. And, except that that, in the report, you can't write it, yeah? You can't say, yeah, I really worked hard, it didn't work, right? <laughs> uh, but that's normally, that should be the, the standard thing. And as a result, because you want to be deliver in the end, people don't really take the risk of working on the difficult questions. Because you are too afraid of failing, if you don't, you know, if you don't write your papers, you don't get a position, and then you're out. So you have to go safe, right? And that's just the, so the idea is, my only piece of advice is, it's okay that you work on some safe problems, but keep a substantial proportion of your time to dream about the things that are, you know, the really big things, because the really big things, they are might, you know, there might be much more in, within reach than one might expect at first. You should, one shouldn't be afraid of the very big questions. Okay. So I expect that the young Mills problem, you know, will be solved soon, right, in the next 10 years, that somebody will knack it. Modulo, if only, you know, people try. Okay, so thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much, Fendlin, for a great talk with lots of inspiration and some very good piece of advice for the young researchers. So we are running a little bit late, but I would like to have at least one question from the audience. And as you can see, we have a different system here. It's so-called catch ball. It contains a microphone. I'm not going to throw it randomly out in the audience and whoever catches it has to ask a question. But uh, if somebody wants, I'm going to try and hit somebody. Well, it would have been nice if you'd been more in the front. Hello? Ah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, I have a really silly question. Do you know what uh, gamma is big enough? Uh, you s well, you yeah. said that at some point... Yeah, uh, to, to see what... Why, yeah, that's, that's actually an easy thing. Which is basically, in, in two dimensions, uh, the cutoff is gamma equal two. Okay. two. Gamma is equal to two. So if, if gamma is two, you know, if gamma is small... It's just, you know, what... Okay. I'm talking in front of, you know, Raghu Varadhan, who, you know, large deviations, he is here. And it's just an elementary large deviations estimate for Brownian motion that tells you, you know, if you try to take exponential gamma something, that you have a martingale, and, you know, it's, it's il very elementary textbook things uh, that tell you that, indeed, you know, the cutoff is at a certain value of gamma that happens to be gamma equal to, to 2. So, you know, Square root of a third is, uh, well, it's a bit, you have a bit of room of margin to, 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 till you get there, but uh, that's, that's basic. There are lots of, I mean, of course, the other values of gamma are interesting too, and there's lots of numerology going on. And uh, interestingly, the numerology, just to, you know, some of the numerology, the physicists got it first, and then it stimulated a whole area of uh, pure mathematics, which has to do with representation theory of infinite dimensional Lie algebra, so Virasoro algebra, for those who heard about these things, 
where you know one classifies certain the and these numbers you know this eight third here is related to some special representations of uh, you know something has is going on there so I'm not going to go you know say big words but it's related to some you know structural mathematical stories but um, yeah but intuitively it's pretty clear right sort of you you want to have these plus and minus infinity that sort of compensate if you take exponential gamma thing, then if gamma is too large, then the whole distribution about the exponential gamma thing will somehow tend to be concentrated around the, the point where ga uh, gamma is, I mean, the, the, the field is really much more infinite than the, the other point somehow, right? So it, somehow the whole metric space will collapse into one point. That's somehow what, what, what's happening. You know, that all the area is there and the rest has nothing. That's basically what happens when gamma is too large in, in your Okay, thank you very much. I don't think we will have time for more questions. So if you can pass the catch box down here so we are ready for the next one. Um, and I just, I would like to apologize for, you know, being here and, you know, the, the rule is to interact with all you people and, uh, you know, I arrived yesterday late and I'll have to leave uh, this afternoon. It's just that, you know, uh, one of the sad aspects of life is uh, sometimes we don't say no enough to invitations. So I have been giving four talks this week, uh, you know, that was a misplanning and therefore I just... Uh, so my apologies for you know, not being able to interact and uh, play the real game of this forum. Uh, well, we are very happy that uh, Wendlin took time to come here, so let's give him a big hand.